Good morning, everyone. Today is the day that we wrap up this series that we have been in for the last few weeks, these last few months, just about all year long. We have been in the book of John, the gospel of John, and today is the culmination of that. Now, you might notice that last week we were on John 17. And today we're going to be on chapter 21, and that's not chronologically the order that it appears in Scripture, is it? Well, we did the resurrection when Easter time was here, and so that's why we got things a little bit out of sequence. But I want to just remind all of us the purpose of the book of John, the purpose of the gospel of John. And John gives this purpose at the very end of the book. He says, all of these things have been written that you may believe, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in His name. It's the whole purpose. John carefully took his eyewitness accounts the things that he had seen Jesus do, the, the miracles, the messages, and he arranged them, he compiled them in the Gospel of John. We looked at the first miracle, which was the, the turning of the water into wine at the wedding of Cana. We looked at Jesus' his meeting with Nicodemus. We saw Jesus with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. We saw Jesus heal a man that had been born blind. We saw Jesus heal someone, a man that could not walk. And we knew, and the people of Jesus' day knew the significance of that, because in Isaiah 35 it says, when your God comes to save you, He will open the eyes of the blind the lame will be able to walk. These are the things that the Messiah, the Christ, will do. And John laid that out very carefully in his gospel. We saw the crucifixion. We saw the resurrection. And we've seen the appearances of Jesus to His disciples. And today, we wrap all of this up Now, if you were John, if you were compiling all of these accounts and you were doing this so that people would have enough evidence to believe, how would you wrap up the gospel of John? How would you wrap up your gospel? Well, I find that John's epilogue, his conclusion, concluding remarks, very interesting. His concluding remarks are a fishing story. He tells a fishing story. That's, that's how he ends the gospel. I, I find that, that very intriguing. Um, fishing stories are sort of like bookends to Jesus' ministry. In the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he's walking around the Sea of Galilee, the shore, and he's calling his disciples, and he's telling them, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. And now, in chapter 21 of John's gospel, we see once again a fishing story, very appropriate. Let's read together the first few verses of John chapter 21. After Jesus revealed Himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and He revealed Himself in this way, Simon Peter Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Now, this could actually be one of my fishing stories. (laughs) Every time I have ever caught a fish in my life, it has seemed like a miracle. But the disciples, they were professional fishermen. 
And so they went fishing, not to be surprised by the miracle of a catch, but to support themselves, and, and just, it, it, it was expected. But here's something that we see by this story. Jesus pulls back the curtain of our own insufficiencies. Insufficiencies are not being enough, not measuring up, coming up short. And if you're a professional fisherman, or even if you're just a fisherman that likes to go out and catch a few fish, catching nothing is insufficient. It's an inadequacy. It's a bit of a failure, actually. Did you know that God often uses our failures? God often uses our frustrations for His purpose. His purpose for failure and frustration is not the same as ours. His purpose is to demonstrate His power. I mean, if we were always at the top of our game, if our health was always as good as it could possibly be, if we never experienced difficulties, there would never be an opportunity for God to step in with His power in our lives. One commentator said that it was interesting that, that the disciples, when Jesus, they didn't know it was Jesus at this point, <clears throat> but when Jesus asked, hey, boys, children, hey, kids, you caught any fish? They were honest. Are we always honest with our fishing stories? The fish was this big, <laughs> but they were honest. And you know, the gospel forces us to admit our failures. The gospel forces us to look at ourselves and to look at the world around us and admit the truth. And I think it's no small thing that that's what the disciples did. They knew, and here's the thing, Jesus was not asking them about their, how, how their night of fishing had gone to find out. Jesus already knew they hadn't caught anything. You know, Jesus had directed the fish away from their nets, and so He knew, but He gave them the opportunity to agree with the truth. And when they did, whenever we agree with God's truth, He's willing to step in and meet us where our, our abilities and our inadequacies are. I love what one commentator said. He said, failure can be the most creative thing in life. I had never thought of that, especially for the believer. But we must have the grace. We must have the grace to admit failure and the humility to receive instruction. And, you know, here's the thing. We're all weak. We're all insufficient. We all, from time to time, fail. The disciples were no different. Not only had they failed to catch fish, but earlier in Jesus' ministry, Peter denied Jesus three times, denied that he even knew Jesus. Now, that's after telling Jesus that I'll do everything for you, though everyone else turn away, I'll be there, even if it means going to prison, even if it means dying, you can count on me. But then, before the rooster crowed the first time, Peter denied Jesus, and he denied him again and again, three times in total insufficiencies, failures. The Apostle Paul also was a man of insufficiencies. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, Paul had, been, Paul had been praying about this thorn in the flesh, and we're not really sure what the thorn in the flesh was. We know it couldn't possibly have been a good thing because Paul was praying earnestly that God would remove that insufficiency, that pain, that problem. He prayed three times, and here's what the answer from God was. My grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect 
in weakness. See, when we fail, when we come up short, when we are insufficient, that's an opportunity. In James chapter 1 verse 2, that's how we're told to view the troubles and trials and difficulties of our lives. View it as an opportunity. When you have troubles, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Rejoice when you're insufficient, when you're coming up short. That's the time that God steps in. You know, the world is full of, of success stories. One of my favorite stories of failure has to do with a, a, a young man. He ran for the legislator in his state, and he lost. He entered business, and a short time later, he went bankrupt. And he actually spent the next 17 years repaying the debts of that business. He fell in love and was planning to get married, but that person got sick and and died. He ran for Congress and lost. He ran for the U.S. Senate and lost. What an insufficient failure. But eventually, he, he refused to give up. And we know this man by the name of Abraham Lincoln. One commentator said, failure, and and I love this, failure is the sin quo non of spiritual progress. Failure is the sin quo non of spiritual progress. I didn't understand what that meant either. Um, (laughs) So I, I, had, I had to look that up because I knew I wanted to use it. But when I found out what it means, here, here is what sin qua non means. It's an essential condition. Failure, listen to this, failure is the essential condition, the essential ingredient of spiritual progress. Absolutely essential. Gives us a different way of looking at failure, doesn't it? Gives us a different way, a more biblical way of looking at our insufficiencies. Everything is poised in our life when we're insufficient. I love how the story continues in verse 6. Jesus said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat. I want to show you a picture. Don't look over here. You'll, you'll, you'll have to look over here. You know, I, I, was, I was trying to read the words, and I was craning my neck on the songs. But here's a picture of a boat on the Sea of Galilee. I took this picture in 2019. That's the Sea of Galilee. That's a boat. Now, here's a picture of a fisherman on a boat in the Sea of Galilee. He's casting his net into the water. I saw him cast his net over and over and over, and he caught nothing. Let's advance to the next. There's the look of dejection on his face. Insufficient, see. Someone on the boat, I was on the boat, and someone on the boat said, cast your net on the right-hand side. Well, he did, and he still caught nothing. (laughs) But the disciples listened to what happened to their nets. So they cast their net, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. You know, Jesus had made a very important point in chapter 15 of John when he said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And and he's, he's displaying that for us here, that even professional fishermen can do nothing apart from him. This is one final illustration of that point. And the lesson is, don't ever rely on your own strength. Our strength is insufficient. Our strength is inadequate. 
we're going to come up short. Rely on His strength. Jesus used one word to describe that, and that word is abide. Abide. Remain in Him. Remain with Him. Verse 7, that disciple whom Jesus loved, we know that's John, therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. That is the same distance, the, the length of a football field. That is actually the same length as one end of our church to the other, the gym entrance to the day school office entrance. That's not a short swim. <laughs> that, 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 I was very impressed that Peter could do that. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. And our next point is that Jesus sets the table for restoration. This is going to be more than just breakfast on the side of the sea. There's going to be some restoration. This is not a random detail. This fishing story is not a random slice of life. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. You find this a bit curious? I, I find it a bit curious. I mean, as I've read through this passage and thought about this passage, I find it very curious that Jesus already has fish cooking on the charcoal fire. And he enables the disciples to catch a large catch of fish. And he tells them to bring some of the fish that you have just caught. Commentator Kent Hughes says this, Though we now serve him on the dark seas of life in this age, our risen Lord wants us to focus on the fact that he is on the eternal shore in the ever-increasing light, preparing a table for us. He wants us to see also that our works for Him are of eternal value. He encourages all of His disciples to bring some of their catch, and He accepts their service and adds the result of their toil to the provision He has already prepared. Jesus did not need their contribution. God does not need our contribution. But He asked for it. He calls for it. He could have multiplied what He already had. But Jesus was teaching the disciples and, and us that our works are valued by Him. And our works are of eternal consequence in His kingdom work. I, I find that very encouraging. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, the 15th chapter of Corinthians is a beautiful chapter. It talks about the resurrection. But at the very end of that chapter, the Apostle Paul says that knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. The New Living Translation translates that verse to say, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Do you know that? Do you sometimes forget that in the difficulties and insufficiencies of your service? Nothing that we'd ever do for the Lord is wasted, is for nothing. So, in verse 11, Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Now, if you remember back, 
In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, when Jesus was calling the disciples, the sons of Zebedee were actually with their father, and they were in a boat on shore, and they were mending nets. They were mending their nets. So it was not unusual for nets to tear and rip. And for a catch this big, the net should have been torn, but, but it wasn't. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now, what's going to happen next? Jesus addresses the core issue. Now, the core issue was not that they were poor fishermen. <laughs> the core issue was not that they weren't willing to work hard. The core issue was something even more deeper than that. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these other disciples around us? The word that Jesus used for love is agape. Peter, son of John, do you agape me more than the rest of the disciples? Peter answered, he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Now, the word that Jesus used is agapeo, agape love. The word that Peter answers back to Jesus with is phileo, a friendship love, a brotherly love. Jesus said, do you love me intentionally? Do you love me completely? And Peter said, Lord, you know I'm fond of you. <laughs> and Jesus said, feed my lambs. 16, verse 16, he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you agape me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, phileo. He said to him, tend my sheep. Now, Peter was getting uncomfortable, and we all know why, because the night that Peter denied Jesus, there was a charcoal fire. Charcoal fires are only mentioned twice in the Gospels. The night that Jesus was betrayed, there was a charcoal fire, and people were warming themselves by the fire when Peter denied that he even knew Jesus. I don't know this man. Three times, and now a charcoal fire. And Jesus has asked the same question one time, He's asked the same question a second time, and here he goes a third time in verse 17. Jesus said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now, this time in the original Greek, Jesus doesn't use the word agape. Jesus bumps down to the word that Peter had been using. This time, Jesus said, Peter, do you phileo love me? Do you really, you've said it twice, but do you really have an affection for me? Am I really your friend? And Peter says, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And he uses phileo again. And then Jesus issues the command again, feed my sheep. What Jesus was doing is he was mirroring Peter's denial. He was mirroring the time that Peter came up short. He was mirroring the time that Peter was inadequate and failed. And he was restoring Peter. He was saying, Peter, do you love me? Then get to work. Follow me and get to work. 
feed my sheep. Now, Jesus was not a shepherd. He didn't have a flock of sheep. He was referring to his followers. Feed my sheep. Give my sheep the true bread. Give my sheep my word. And then Jesus goes on to tell Peter in verse 18, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, but when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Now, without this next verse, that would be difficult to understand. <clears throat> but verse 19 <clears throat> clarifies. This he said to show what, by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Follow me. Jesus clarifies the cost of commitment. You know, the other week Jesus said that they persecuted me, so don't be surprised when they persecute you. If you follow me and you, say, and you see how they've treated me, how could you expect better treatment? The closer we follow Jesus, the more like Jesus we're likely to be treated. He clarifies the cost of commitment to Peter. He says, Peter, you're going to get old, and people are going to lead you around, and they're going to stretch you out. And, and the church fathers in the first century testify that, that Peter, later in life, he was crucified. He was stretched out. Now, it's not in Scripture. It's in church tradition, church history. I find it very interesting that Jesus turned the conversation to death. What kind of death Peter was to glorify God with? Do our deaths glorify God? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, the one thing that, this is not the most cheerful comment to make, but the one thing that each one of us has in common is that if the Lord tarries, if Jesus doesn't come back, we're all going to die. You know, the mortality rate for humans is 100%. But we will have the opportunity to glorify God even in that moment. Ecclesiastes 7.4 says, a wise person thinks a lot about death, but a fool thinks only about having a good time. So it's not morbid to think about death. It, it might be morbid to dwell on it. I mean, we can certainly take it to the extreme. But knowing that there is coming a day when we will cross that threshold, and hopefully that day is far into the future, but here's the thing. We don't know. None of us know. So living to glorify God puts us in a great position to glorify God when the time comes for us to transition to the other world. This is wisdom. And Jesus was telling Peter, I want you to continue to glorify me. I want you to follow me. You know, that verse, I, I, I read it over and over, and I know it applies to Peter, but I couldn't help but think when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, but when you were old, another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Does that, does that sound familiar to anyone but me, needing help dressing, not being able to walk around like we used to? D does that sound familiar? It sounds familiar, but it doesn't sound too good, does it? If we live long enough, this verse will likely come true for us as well, that we will need help getting dressed. We'll need help moving around. We will be insufficient in some of the things that we have always been able to do. So what is the point of the infirmities? What, what's my point in, in saying this? Well, my point is this. The invitation for each one of us is to follow Jesus. Follow me, Jesus said, not just to his disciples, but to all of us. Follow me. Even when we 
get old? Even when our health fails? Absolutely. Especially then. Especially then. Glorify God. We can glorify God as our physical bodies. And you know, the Scripture calls our, our bodies clay pots, that the gospel has been entrusted in clay pots. So what happens as we become insufficient, as we become increasingly more inadequate physically? My power is made manifest in weakness. My grace is sufficient. It wasn't just sufficient for Peter. It wasn't just sufficient for Paul. It's sufficient for each one of us. You know, we need to turn everything over to God. We need to let God have our strengths. We need to serve Him when we're in the prime of life. We need to follow Him. We need to get into the habit of following Him, abiding in Him. And you can't abide in the living Word if you don't abide in the written Word. Follow me. Now, I love, I love what Peter does next, and, and obviously John has a sense of humor because John was following along behind Jesus and Peter. And I, I don't know about you, but I, I grew up in a family where I was, I was the oldest, and I had a younger brother, and I was always very concerned about equity. I, I was especially concerned that he received the punishment that was due him. <laughs> Many times he and I would get caught doing something wrong together, and since I was the oldest, a lot of times I would, I would receive my punishment first. And on one occasion, my brother, he, he was in his pajamas, and our punishment was spankings. You might, some, some people might have to look that up. But <clears throat> they were a very real thing in my life in those days. Well, I wanted to be first that time because I wanted to get the punishment over. And so I said, well, take me. I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Let's get it out of the way. So I went to the back room. My father took his belt off. And I received correction. So when it, and then my father called for my brother. And so my brother came into the back room and he was in his pajamas, but he had stuffed pillows <laughs> in the back of his pajamas. And so he was, and here's the thing my father got so tickled, he started laughing. I, I've been trying to forgive him for years. He laughed, and he called for my mother. He said, honey, come in here. You've got to see this. And she saw it, and she laughed. And that was the end. I mean, you can't punish a child that's that funny. I was never that funny. <laughs> so to this day, my brother is owed a spanking. <laughs> Listen to what Peter says. He turns around. And he saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? Jesus, when, when Peter saw him in verse 21, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? What about him? Is anybody going to lead him around and dress him? Is anybody going to stretch out his arms and take him where he doesn't want to go? And Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Don't worry about John. Don't worry about your younger brother. Don't worry about someone else. Worry about yourself. You follow me. Follow me. Follow me. 
so the saying spread among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not going to die. But he said, if it is my will that you remain until I come, what is it to you? You know, it's easy to misunderstand Scripture, and that's why we need to take Scripture in context. That's why we need to take the entirety of Scripture. The enemy wants to take Scripture out of context. The enemy does not want us to read the whole entire Bible. Why do you think it's so difficult? Why do you think so many believers have never read the whole Bible? The enemy is at work. The enemy wants us to misunderstand what we do read, but we're called to listen carefully, read carefully, understand the context, grasp the meaning. Verse 24 and 25, the last two verses of the Gospel of John, this is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things. And we know that his testimony is true. Now, there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not obtain the books that would be written. But these have been written, we know so that you may believe in Him, and by believing, have life in His name. So we come to the conclusion of the Gospel of John, and we're left with the question, do you believe? Do you have enough evidence from this eyewitness testimony? to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, to place your faith and trust not in your own abilities, not in your own go goodness, but in the finished work of the cross, and then live your life with His power. You know, God is in the business of turning our insufficiencies into surpluses. Let me say that again. God is in the business of turning our insufficiencies, our inadequacies, our failures into surpluses and successes. I'm very encouraged by that. It's not my power. It's His power. And the same is true in your life. I, I don't know what the Lord has laid on your heart today. This is God's Word, and we know that His Word never returns to Him void, but it always accomplishes everything that He sets out for it to accomplish. And my prayer this week has been for each one of you, for each one of us, that the Gospel of John, God's Word, would accomplish everything in our lives that God wants to accomplish. Maybe you need to come today. I'm going to be standing right down there with, with our spiritual response team, and we would love to talk with you, to give you more information about what it means to place your faith and trust in Jesus. Maybe the Lord has put it on your heart that, that you need to join Riverland Hills and roll up your sleeves and abide in Him and work for the kingdom with us. Maybe you just need to come forward to pray. We're going to be down here at the front. However the Lord leads you, respond. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank You for these words that were written that we might believe. And Lord, my prayer is that we all do believe and that we all will follow You. Lord, we turn this time of decision over to You. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.